Anyway, I'm Rhonda with Step Up for Students, and um, we have a partnership with NWEA, and um, they offer a digital assessment, which is called um, the Measures of Academic Progress. And so we call it MAP for short. And it provides a wealth of information. And so tonight I'm here to kind of give you um, a brief overview of what your teacher is going to be able to see about your student and your child and where they are and how they're progressing and how you'll be able to track it throughout time. So I'm going to start with a little video, kind of gives you a little idea about what MAP is and then we'll get started, okay? I get emotional every time we watch the video. <laughs> so I apologize now. <clears throat> um, and I've seen it a million times. That's why I asked. But... <clears throat> so um, the difference between map growth and um, other assessment types you've seen in the past is that um, how many do you remember standardized tests when you were in kids in school? Mm -hmm. They were so much fun. Um, so normally at the end of the school year, we take that standardized test. So normally between April and May, and it was like a whole week, and um, the report comes back like June. Schools send, usually send that information home and the report card for parents to look at and review. And then teachers are gone over summer, and they come back, and then they look at last year's uh, data assessment. And then by maybe September or October, when things are really starting to heat up in the classroom and learning is happening and they're progressing, maybe teachers are going, oh wait, maybe they're not hitting benchmarks or they are just way above. And they go back to look at data, but the data now is almost eight or nine months old. So we're not really looking at anything that's right now. That's the difference with math. Instead of taking it one time a year, you take it three times a year. It's digital, so it's adaptive, so it moves. So we roster students in at their grade level. So we would roster them in at first grade, kindergarten, second grade. Um, and it starts asking everybody in the room, kind of like gets the same questions, the first couple. Depending upon whether they get them right or wrong, it gets harder or easier. And that's where no two students will have the same question in the room. And they'll never have the same question ever again. Once it, they use it in that test bank, it goes to their list of not to ask again. Um, once they get to that point where they're getting a lot of right answers and the computer adjusts, it'll get to their sweet spot and then it'll hone in on those skills that are under that area to really find out what they're ready to learn. Okay? So, math growth, um, we love it because of what it gives us as far as information goes. Unlike the other test, um, it gives us the grade level equivalent. This gives us a grade level norm. And so what it says is, is that through kindergarten to 10th grade, we have a RIT score, which is between a 120 and a 250. And that, so when you have your baby and you go to the pediatrician and they give you that 
they're on the 95th percentile for weight or for height or length. Um, this is kind of the same idea. So again, when we're like measuring our children as they grow and we measure them on the wall, we can see over time how tall they're getting. Think of the same way as their um, growth assessment. So we are measuring where they are, kindergarten, first grade, and as they grow, we're gonna continue to measure that growth over time. And that's what that RIT score does, okay? It's in, um, and it's independent of grade level. So if your student is in second grade and they're performing on a third grade level, it's not gonna show third grade level, but it's gonna show a third grade RIT score, okay? Does that make sense? Everybody with me so far? Okay. You can stop since it's a small group. If you have questions, just please. Um, and so what we refer to the RIT score is ready for instruction today. So unlike those other standardized tests that measure mastery, this measures instructional growth. So it measures where your student is ready for. So within these um, RIT scores, we have RIT bands. And so we can see that this one is a 191 to 200. And if we're looking at literature and key ideas, it shows us that this is the developed stage. So there's usually three stages within those RIT scores. One would be a reinforce. So we kind of can I get the idea of what reinforce means, right? They need reinforcement on those skills. Develop means that they're ready to take it and, and really hone in on some major skills that are under that RIT score. But then there's introduce. And introduce means that they're ready to learn the same skills, but at a deeper level. So we can look at it and say, um, they're gonna analyze, they compare, they describe, and then down here we can talk about if they make inferences. So it's really the depth of ability that we're talking about, okay? So this tells us what a RIT score is. Um, macro test scores are called RIT scores. These represent where students are ready for instruction, just like we talked about, and then helping students understand that will make for a more engaging test session. So what we're trying to do with math is make it so that students are more involved in the process of testing, um, but it's not a high stakes test. This isn't a, I got you, you can't do this. This is a, you're ready to learn this. So it really changes the mindset of how we do assessment. And then we look at um, the test is designed to help your teacher share that information. So not only does the, the test give information to the family, more importantly, gives it to the teacher because the teacher is going to be able to see what skills they're ready for and make the learning more individualized because they're going to be able to assess exactly where your student is. So in the past, we would have that um, they're ready for or they've mastered literary text. What does that mean to the parent? Unless you're a teacher, you don't necessarily know because it's all in educator language, right? Vocabulary. But this will help you identify exactly what your student's ready for. So within literature text or informational text, they're ready to learn about chapter books and the author and the publisher and the illustrator and what the cover of the book looks like, and you'll know exactly that kind of information at that level, which is really great because it breaks it down and makes it really easy to understand. Um, and I think this is really key. A student is expected to answer up to 50% of the questions incorrectly. So <laughs> for some students, that's really hard, right? Those overachievers who like to to achieve and they like to know what they're doing and they, they so sometimes they get slowed down in the process because they really want to make the right answer and select the right answer we need to tell them you're expected to get half of this wrong and that's a good thing because that means that you're testing up right and it's helping identify where you really are so it starts with easy questions and then progress harder as they answer the question correctly is that correct right? okay. and it does the opposite so once it starts getting them correct if they start getting them incorrect it'll balance down mm -hmm. until it really hones in on where they are okay. which is pretty awesome yes. okay kind of like <laughs> yes yes and it is on um digital so that's, I think, you know, we have to remember that everything is a little bit of a learning curve, especially when we're talking kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Um, 
because it's read to them in those levels of third grade, they have to read it. So again, that would be another little piece of a learning curve when they get there um, because they're no longer being read to. But just clicking and dragging, all those things kind of are a little bit difficult for them to begin with. So as you progress and the third time they take the test, especially kindergartners, they really do much better. Um, but and you really need three data points to really see where your student is. We can't really base anything off of one point. So the teacher is not going to instruct them how to do it, right? Or so they, they do a practice session. So they'll come in and they'll practice clicking and dragging and, and selecting answers. They, it's a small five, mm -hmm. six questions, and they get the practice of it. And um, that allows the teacher to identify maybe what students need to do it again or to make sure that they have it um, ready to go. But like reading the question, like identify which shape does not belong here, are they going to be able to read that? Yeah, they they read read it to it. them, so they have mm -hmm. earbuds so they can hear. Yeah. So they learn that if they have to touch the, the, the speaker. ear icon so they can hear it. I see. So we go around and we see if they're not touching it, we can help them and say, you need to touch the icon so you can hear it. Um, yeah. They're very hands-on in the early stages mm -hmm. yeah. to make sure that they're getting everything, yes. Um, so, and again, the difference between uh, instructional level and mastery. So, map growth assessment provides information about the instructional level of a student. It provides a roadmap of, for the student as toward achieving mastery. And then, there are not tests for determining mastery. So, it's not going to say your student has completely a mastered informational text because there's always something to learn in informational text. So, but it'll show us where they are within that idea. Okay. So, um, this I kind of left in just so that you know. Um, this is part of what the teachers do. Um, the math test builds a unique test for each student. The computer displays one question at a time. On the screen, students select an answer and the test gets more difficult as you answer correctly. Map growth will build a test that is specific to each student. So it really does make it individualized. Students are not expected, like we just talked about, to know every answer. And the tests are not timed and can be paused and finished at another time. So I know that Miss Jenny and, and your teachers, if they see that their students are kind of fidgeting and they're not really engaged, they'll pause the test and go outside <laughs> and blow off some steam, if you will, let them play for a little bit, and then they'll come back and finish. That's okay. Um, we want to make sure that the testing environment is friendly to kids. Again, it's not a gotcha, it's what do you know, and how can we help you progress. And the average time uh, for students in grades three um, and above is 45 minutes, and it's usually just uh, frustrates kids if they take an hour and a half. Like, you know, so it's a real fine um, measurement of time and um, practice, I want to say, as we go forward. So the good news is, is that your proctors and facilitators here at the school have done this now. And so they're, they're really keen on being able to know your student and know what they're capable of and know when they're getting frustrated. And they don't have to stop everybody in the room to help one student. So if they see one student is really struggling just being engaged, they'll pause that student's test and help them go outside, do what they need to do to actually come back and be refocused, okay? Um, kids don't need to come to school sick in order to be tested because they can test at a later time. Um, especially now, we don't want kids at school sick. Um, so it's really a helpful idea to make sure that everybody knows that you don't have to complete it all in one setting. You can come back and, and pick it up as you need to. So. And then what happens after testing? So after testing with your student, Miss um, Jenny back there, she will close out the test and then 24 hours later they start getting reports and start getting access to what the how the student did. So it's really fast. In the past, we would have to box all that stuff up, send it out to be scored, and then you wait for it to come back. As a principal, it was a nightmare for me to wait. I was so anxious I wanted to see how the kids did. So this is really great because you can, you can get it pretty much 24 hours afterwards. Um, then <laughs> your teachers and me have been uh, doing a lot of training and a lot of conversations. And so 
I really feel good about um, working here at Cornerstone. It's been fabulous the last couple years I've been here. They are very supportive. They are very on it when it comes to your children and these assessments. Um, they are at every training. They come with questions. They are building reports. They, I mean, they try, I think they sit around and try to challenge me. And so they try to come up with, you know, who has the best question. Um, but it, it's been fabulous to work with them. And I know that you are in really good hands. And I am always available to them or to you if you need any help at all. Um, they have my number. And I'm, I'm very happy to, to work with this, this school and with you. Um, it has been great to see the growth at this school. It's pretty amazing. And then, um, so I think one of the things that when we talk about math, um, this is a whole mindset change from standardized testing to talking about growth and achievement. And so when we talk about that, it's not just choosing a different assessment, it really is choosing a journey to improve student achievement because that's what this is all about. It's about your child and that your child is growing and achieving and um, making sure that they are getting the best out of their education that they can. So, I know you have questions for me. Um, I wanna pull up the report that we were gonna talk about, right? Yes, ma'am. So give me one second. Oh, I wanted to say it should be this. So if we were to look at this, where did my kids go? Yeah, they are. Which student do you think had the better year? The one on the left or the one on the right? According to that RIT score. Right? Right, right, because the higher the number, the better. It's not golf. Although, when I play golf, I like it to be that way. Um, but if we if we look at this, who had the better year? Oh, whoever made the most progress. Whoever made the most progress. So now we can see that this the little boy on the left actually had a better year academically than maybe the little girl. She might have started out higher, but she didn't grow as much. So that's something to really think about. In the past, we always talk about students achieving, right? That A. But that doesn't really measure growth. And eventually, students that are high achievers might hit that wall of not being able to achieve at that high rate anymore because they come to like that end of giftedness, if you will. Um, and so this is where we can see that really it's all about the growth. Because even if they're a high achiever, they still have to grow, right, in order to continue to achieve. So. It's really cool to see the data points as we're gonna talk about them because you'll actually see how your student is growing. And you can see that even if they started off kind of behind, you'll see that they catch up and maybe even excel, okay? The other thing is that um, the RIT score is normed nationally. So when you see your scores, you're gonna see how they would perform nationally up against other students who are taking the test. And I wanna say, 16 million have taken this test and have been normed. I thought that was a storm. No, that's Mr. Chuck. Yes. Getting us ready for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so your um, teachers have access to all kinds of reports. And one of the ones that I'm going to pull up tonight is our um, growth report. So I don't have access to any of your students' data. This is all just sample. Yeah. Yeah. 
So this is our um, student goal setting worksheet, and your teachers have prepared these for you tonight, right? They have them with you tonight. Yes. Okay. And um, so when we look at this report, these blue bars show us how your student performed. The dotted line is the projected RIT score. So when they start out assessing and they get their first number, and then they go to the next number, the next assessment, they will compare like student to like student. Like I said, like 16 million students have taken this assessment. So it will compare students that started off in the same grade at the same RIT score, and however they performed in that norm group is how many points your student will be assigned to grow during that time. So that dotted line shows us what their projected growth is. We can see that there was a spring 19, fall 19, winter 20, and spring 20. So you'll be able to tell when the assessment was done by this part here, and this is our RIT score. So we can see, and um, this is math, and we can see reading. We can see this is the goal performance areas. So this shows us that under math, they are assessed in operations and algebraic thinking, numbers and operations, geometry and measurement and data. Yours may look a little different because they're younger, um, but you will get the same idea. The <coughs> green numbers, the highlighted green, are areas of strength, where our yellow are kind of areas of focus. So we need to really work on those. If they don't have a color, that means they're right on where they're supposed to be, right? Uh, let me see. Again, it's broken down by the, the time the assessment was done. And um, we can see that also, too, you can see like areas of green don't always stay green. And they don't always stay white. <laughs> and they go into green or they go back to yellow. And that's because as a student learns, it's going to be a little bit of a roller coaster, and that's okay. Sometimes they take a couple steps forward, and sometimes they regress a little bit, and then they get a full knowledge, and it comes forward, and you'll see big, big points of growth. But we really just really want to focus on how's our student growing, and how are they achieving. The other thing that I love about this form is the student action plan, and this is where your teachers really come into play, because they have already gone in and looked at these numbers, and saw their areas of focus, and they've broken it down to where your student needs help in. So <clears throat> remember, this may be an area that they should have had maybe in preschool, or an area that maybe they should have had in first grade, and it doesn't mean that it wasn't taught. It means that when it was taught, it just didn't sink in, or maybe they were sick that week. Something happened that it just didn't get a firm foundation. So you might see one of your teachers send home something that looks like <coughs> we did this already, like last year. It's just reaffirming that they need it again. And so they're sending it home to, for you to, as parents to kind of work with them on to make sure that they are solidifying that information. And that will help give them that instant growth, if you will. Because once they get that concept, there's other things that are kind of floating around that should hook to that, that will, and will have growth. Does that make sense? Because everything's like, a, I, I like to think of the way that we learn things, we, our brain automatically puts it into like a file cabinet, and it files it under the folders that it's attached to. And so sometimes if we don't have that folder ready to go, that information kind of lingers out there until the folder gets there. And then all of a sudden it just piles in. Okay. Any questions on this? No? Well, one, mine doesn't have the dotted line. And Does that the picture scan? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So next year when she takes it, then there will be that dotted line. Yes. So she expects with that report areas to improve the island? Yes. If they have the yellow. Yes. Right? Yeah. And that's what the teacher has written in the plan. So that when you meet with Miss Margarita, she has written some ideas. Okay. Yes. So, and they will be doing some of this in, in class too. Mm -hmm. So it's not all parent driven. Right. right. But some of this, some of these things may be parent driven just because they're needing to expose them to what the curriculum is for today to get them through first grade or second grade, um, or even kindergarten. So we might need to send some things home. Um, but that's where we become the partners and we work together to make sure that we're achieving what we need to. Oh, you're welcome. Did you 
Right, so we're getting the kids ready so that they know how to take these tests so that when they really do matter, it's not the first time they've ever seen it. Right, right, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So why it was huge for me, like, just to, like, yeah, talk about some of the sports, <laughs> yeah. too, just Breathe. to know that it's, like, sort of just yeah. preparing them for the future. So most standardized <coughs> assessments, like, we talk about the Florida Standards Assessment, that FSA or the FCAT starts in third grade. Mm -hmm. Most schools feel like that's a little too late. If we've got a student who may be struggling by third grade to assess where they're struggling at, they've already missed kindergarten, first grade, and second grade. So they're already like four years behind if we, if we really want to think about it. So this allows your school and your teachers to start addressing where your students are right away. And so that way when they are ready to take that third grade assessment, whatever it looks like, wherever you are, they'll be ready and prepared. Okay, that's a good point. Is Madison public schools as well? Because this is my first time. So in some schools, yes. Some um, and some in, in some states have adopted MAP as their standardized assessment already. Okay. Um, and some schools do this in addition to the, F, uh, the FSA or um, other standardized tests because of the knowledge that it gives the teacher. And we're able to assess and see where the student is ready to learn other tests can't do that necessarily, so a lot of schools are using both. So you use it for older kids too? Yes, it goes all the way up through 10th grade. Um, 11th and 12th graders can take it, but they're not really normed because they're expecting 11th and 12th graders to take the ACT and SAT. But this does link, so as they get older, so like the third grade will be taking the test. Um, when they do that, you, they, it will link it to the FSA, so you can see where your child would perform on Florida Standards Assessment. And then as they get older, it links it to the um, ACT Aspire, the ACT, and the SAT. So you can see how your child is expected to perform on those tests and if they're on track. I know that's a little early, but I love the fact that we can actually see that we're on track and that we're headed in the right direction. Any questions? No, I don't.